Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Lifestyle with Dr. Moby. And today we have great guest all the way from North Carolina. Let's welcome Jeffrey Dotty. Right? Hi, how are you doing? Thank you for having me. So thank you for coming to our show. And I would uh, leave intro to Jeff. Uh, Jeff, go ahead and tell me about yourself. Well, um, I am an author and a podcaster. Uh, we, um, our current podcast that we're working on is called Speaking of Crime. It's a true crime podcast. Our current case that we're working on right now is the Kylan Schulte and Crystal Turner case mm -hmm. out in Moab, Utah. Um, two w young women who were recently married mm -hmm. to each other, and they were murdered on August, on the night of August 14th, uh, this year. And th it kind of was overshadowed quite a bit by the Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry case that, uh, had such international, uh, fame. And it's, it's important to us that we let everyone know that that happened about the exact time, same time as Gabby's case. And it was just so overshadowed. It really needed to be brought to the public's attention because they're still looking for the perpetrator. Hmm. He uh, was described by the girls to some friends on the night of the murder as a creepy dude who had hmm. camped right next door to them, actually kind of uncomfortably close to them. Uh, violating some camping protocols. Mm. And so there really is very little to go on in this case. And so right now the police have a lot of appeals out to the public for tips and whatnot. Uh, if uh, anyone has heard anything, if anyone has seen anything, if they have any idea, if they, uh, if they have any familiarity with the case, uh, they should contact the police and let them know. Uh, the sheriff uh, out there by Moab would be the appropriate person. I don't have his information off the top of my head. But uh, I write fiction, mm -hmm. nonfiction. Uh, I've written two true crime books, one called Piggyback, mm -hmm. which actually spent about four and a half months on Amazon's Top 100 and A Convenient Man, which came out last year, which uh, gained a little attention and it had a nomination for a Pulitzer Prize, but nothing ever came of that. But it was well, still an honor. It was still an honor. Yeah, still. I mean, I never had a guest who could say that. So I'm so proud of to hear that, that you were even considered for that. So. And that is a great thing. Well, congratulations. So that's a uh, lot you. of achievement. And I, I think, you know, you have really very unique. I mean, I have a lot of podcasters here on our shows, but I've never had anybody talk about crime. And, um, you know, this is very unique. And I would, I must say that is really very inspiring too, because, you know, a lot of, um, I think, you know, as you know, a lot of people watch the headline news, but like you said, there are cases which were on the headline news, and then there are cases which should have been also in the news equally because every crime is a crime. Uh, but for some reason, they don't get that public attention. Absolutely. There are so many crimes that just kind of fade away because there's not an instant resolution or because the people involved weren't cared about. Uh, mm. uh, good examples of that are when gangbangers die or drug addicts or alcoholics or homeless people, so many of them just vanish 
and there is little to no uh, publicity in their cases because they're not deemed as important enough to get the publicity. And that's just wrong. Humans are humans are humans, whether they be from, you know, Hollywood or whether they be from some back alley in Chicago. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, mm. the human beings should not be murdered and have no one care. Mm. So what we try and do in our podcast is we try and focus um, somewhat on the lesser known cases. Mm -hmm. We did cover Gabby Petito because honestly, who didn't? Mm. But we also are spending a great deal of time and effort on this case. And we will go on to other cases that have just kind of gone cold and we'll try and focus some attention on them to get some help for their families. Everyone deserves closure and everyone deserves justice. And that's the main message, I think, that, you know, like you said, there were there are cases which will always get, uh, you know. And the other thing is, you know, there are cases which I always feel that, uh, you know, people who do bad things, they're getting more more publicity, although we should never uh, do that to criminals because uh, first, uh, I mean, they did all this to be actually, um, uh, in their opinion, to be famous, but actually is notorious. So, uh, but yes. we, so the more we talk and the more we highlight, and then this is a very sad, uh, you know, state of affairs because that's how it is run. And, uh, you know, for TRP purpose or whatever reasons, people get them highlighted and I, th I think I remember uh, there was a uh, I think a pilot I think he took down this aircraft uh, I think it was a Lufthansa or something uh, he took yeah. down uh, all passengers down and said oh now my name will go in history or whatever and this you know this is insane this is uh, yeah you know you're always going to have crazy i mean one of the big arguments that we hear a lot of times in um, in the media is about uh stricter gun laws mm -hmm. and uh, what i'd like to point out i i understand that i completely understand that feeling and that desire but you can't legislate crazy uh, what I'd like to point out is how many, how many terrible attacks have we seen that didn't involve guns? Uh, you know, the uh, 9 11, for example, they used airplanes. Uh, Timothy McVeigh used a rental truck full of fertilizer. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just, you know, guns alone aren't what mm -hmm. has to be legislated. There has to be a way to, you know, I would like to say that there should be a way to legislate crazy, but there really isn't. Uh, mm -hmm. A, because so often the people with that kind of crazy in them hide it fairly well. Uh, they just fly under the radar. Mm -hmm. So I, I just feel that, you know, while the legislation idea for controlling like gun laws and things like that is, is, at heart, a well-meaning legislation idea, I just don't think it's a workable solution. And, you know, uh, I think you definitely, if you look at a lot of crimes um, committed, they are not all by guns, for sure. But there is a common theme. Let's talk about even, uh, you know, Floyd case, you know, um, that a gentleman died uh, from uh, police and I mean it, there was no gun yes. involved, but it was kind of mishandled all the way. Since mm -hmm. and I mean there are you know uh, don't take me wrong there were the one who shot a lot of on the crowd by gun. Well, it was in Vegas, right? So yes, okay. And then there are crazy like that too. And then school shootings, absolutely. You know there are yeah. Uh, I think, you know, we all agree there are, has to be some kind of safety thing. Uh, I mean, course or whatever. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have tighter legislation on guns or not. You know, I'm not, I'm really not in either camp simply because 
I, I believe that whatever happens, no matter how much, if all the guns in the world vanished tomorrow, yeah, uh, the crazy people would still find ways to kill lots of people, mm. and that's just and that's just unfortunate. And that's part of what, for me, makes true crime so fascinating. It's not so much uh, the manner of the killings or the manner of whatever crime is committed. It's more about what is the crazy involved? What, what is the head situation of the individual who commits these crimes? We just try and understand these monsters, and maybe that's what can uh, lead us to a point where we can put a stop to them. And, I, you know, I, absolutely. I think you have an excellent point that, you know, we need to know uh, the full scope of this. Uh, you know, those are not just, you know, uh, just uh, guns are not just uh, always a problem. Uh, there are actually the people behind it are the problem, you know, whether they use gun, whether they use knife, whether you use hate, whether they use uh, you whatever to. And, right, and if right. You, if if you also I know it with the story, the first murder of mankind I know you heard but was from Adam's uh, two brothers, right? He two killed, sons. Yeah. yeah, two sons. Sorry. Cain and Abel. Uh, yeah. And he killed the other one with what stone, right? Uh I believe it was, yes. Yes. So it wasn't gun in was. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and there are so many murders every year that are don't involve guns. It's mm -hmm. And that's what made this a fascinating study for me. Uh, I got involved in true crime, or I should say my interest in cr true crime happened because of John Wayne Gacy. Uh, John Wayne Gacy lived uh, about 30 miles, not even that, about 25 miles from where I grew up. Mm -hmm. And that came to light shortly before Christmas in, if I recall, it was 1977, and I was 15 years old, and he was killing his target area was, uh, as far as age groups was boys between the ages of 14, and I think his oldest was like 24. Mm -hmm. So I was right in his sweet spot, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that he was handcuffed, you know, tricking these boys in, handcuffing them, drugging them, you know, and assaulting them, it kind of shook me because I grew up on a farm. I was a farm kid, a strong kid. And I always felt that if someone couldn't hit me harder than a bull kicks, then I was in good shape. I could fight back. But when you think about people being so deceptive and tricking these kids into allowing him to handcuff them, and then he would do what he did with them and strangle them. Mm -hmm. There's no way you can defend yourself against that. And that kind of shook me up. And it was then I took an interest in true crime. And we had like John Wayne Gacy going on. And then we had um, Ted Bundy and yeah. Jeffrey Dahmer all in a short period of time. A lot of these uh, big serial killers were coming out in the 70s and early to mid 80s uh, before DNA evidence became a big deal and they started getting caught sooner. So what that that just that whole era, because that's when I was coming of age, just it made me wonder what made these people tick. And I've been fascinated by true crime ever since. No, I think this is very important. I think it's by itself a big, big area of learning how our human behavior changes or why is there a change, you know, and then they use every and also all crime involved, not only just death, you know, there will be people, uh, you know, sexually abused or physically abused or mentally abused, whatever, and that is still a crime, you know. So, right. you know, so those are, um, you know, those are also crimes. And the question always, I think, in um, human behavior, which um, is actually, um, it's unique that, you know, 
I don't know if there are there crimes in animals. In animals, yeah, there. You know, you think about um, lionesses that uh, kill cubs in their own pack in the animal kingdom. That's a crime. You know, no, like, and, and how do they it, revenge? They just settle. Well, uh, they're ostracized. Uh, if a lioness in a you know in a pride uh, actually kills other cubs, then she's literally shunned from the cry uh, from the pride, and they generally go to live on the outskirts of the pride. And it if they go to another pride and repeat that behavior, they'll be ostracized there. It, which usually, if they're by themselves, it means a short life. So that's kind of their punishment. Okay. So that's for, for what about others, um, uh, dogs, cats? Or... I, you know, I really don't know um, if they have cri uh, crimes, but I knew, I know a pack thing is, is very important to them. You either learn to behave with, uh, within the pack mm -hmm. in appropriate manners mm -hmm. or you're ostracized. Mm -hmm. which is sort of what we do in our society. You either behave within our society or you're put in jail, which is a form of forced Ostr ostracization. Okay. And then becomes the important thing is if there are too many people in jail, then the question becomes, you know, how to handle because all even jails have limits in terms of, what they can handle or how much they can handle, right? Yeah, um, that's that's a question that uh, the human race has been dealing with for quite a while. Uh, the most common method of dealing with having too many criminals in your society has often led to penal count colonies. I mean, that's how Australia was founded. Mm. Uh, it was a it was a penal colony, and. It was considered punishment, and I think when you look at the kinds of animals, everything in Australia seems to either want to poison you or eat you. So uh, I think that's pretty good punishment, mm. uh, pretty severe. Mm. But I I don't know where we're going because we're running out of places to uh, put criminals. Mm. And one of the things that we have going on in our criminal system, and I think every criminal system, because there are mistakes made, and we've covered some of these cases fairly extensively, is there are wrongful convictions. Mm -hmm. And the Innocence Project has estimated that somewhere is around 5% of our prison population across the United States are actually wrongfully convicted criminals. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they're there and they're innocent. Whether they're innocent of everything, you know, of let me rephrase that. Whether they're innocent of other crimes has little bearing on whether they're innocent of the crime that they're in prison for. Uh, I wrote uh, I wrote two books on a case of a man that was wrongfully convicted, and he was no angel. His, uh, you know, he, he's a guy I. I um, have become friends with uh, only after I found out that he was innocent, but we've become good close friends and I like him, but he had, did have uh, problems in his past. Um, a lot of failed marriages, uh, some accusations and things. But if you look at the history of most wrongful convictions, Police don't tend to try and uh, frame angels. Uh, they don't make that kind of an error. They usually have at least some minor basis for believing that they could be capable of committing the crime. Mm -hmm. And so we're not talking about perfectly innocent individuals as far as their whole life scheme. But with wrongfully convicted criminals, here's the problem that I have. I believe, you know, that most of the time, either the prosecutors or the detectives know that they don't have a solid case. And because they have such a focus on this individual, 
they're willing to fudge the rules a little bit in order to get a conviction or to get an arrest. And they need to understand that the citizens of whatever country or whatever state or whatever city don't pay them to get a conviction or a arrest. We pay them to get the right conviction and the right arrest. That justice isn't truly justice unless it's founded on truth. And that's, and that's a basic rule that uh, we need everyone in our justice system to live by. Okay. And I think that also brings another important question. Is that justice, is it justice for all or is it across all races or is it some oh, yeah. are uh, penalized more because of their way they look or what color or what or uh, there are some uh, some are given a little leniency towards that versus so are there different interpretation based on that i i think yes i think i think it's kind of a pendulum it swings back and forth there are times where there are more convictions based on race, religion, uh, sexual preference. And I think there are also times where the pendulum swings the other way. Yeah. And I'm not talking per se, per se um, any certain date or, or anything like that. I'm just thinking in maybe even in just in different areas in, the, in any country. Uh, the rules may be applied to individuals uh, unequally, unfairly, and I think that's that's a universal wrong. I think that's something that that does happen in different areas, and when attention is focused on it, then it, then I think the pendulum swings the other way, and they become uh, more fair, uh, perhaps overly fair. I don't know. You know, that that's, you know, and, and when I'm saying that, I'm, I'm just saying that the police may become afraid to do their job, that, which is what we're seeing in America today. Uh, it, we notice the number of people applying for police jobs have shrunk significantly. Police departments are having a hard time hiring new police officer, <clears throat> excuse me, simply because there's been so much focus on the things that were done wrong. And I guess, and that's what I mean. I'm not saying that, you know, they're, they're favoring anybody. I'm just saying that they've become afraid to do their job. And so I think in that manner, it, it can cause problems too, because some people who richly deserve to be arrested may not be arrested simply because there aren't enough police to, do the job and that uh, also true uh, you know like it's like any solution uh, you have to come to the uh, you know root of it and try to address it so absolutely right i feel you know i have a lot of my patients as police officer and also you know um, uh, other law enforcement too and i always feel um, you know they are physically and mentally both need optimization so physically Absolutely. i've seen yeah and physically i've seen that uh, you know they could be having problems uh, with the, with their health a lot of them and then they themselves um, you know should be actually have better uh, you know criteria so so they should be actually more um, fit in physically in my opinion to handle the job so second is right. to, um, mentally is very important because um, there has to be a lot of education like anything right now we have we have to go through also a lot of um, you know training uh, diff all different these are new learning which um, we never had before in our life but as as you learn and you become uh, you know more used so now I think the demographics have changed. Everything has changed. So they have to have better understanding of mental health because uh, face it, a lot of right now medical problems um, have the basis of psych or mental health. And 
And I gave you example, I was, you know, working in the emergency room and, you know, we had, uh, a, you know, person came and said, I'm suicidal and, you know, is a veteran. So, and so I said, uh, so they say, okay, let's put him in psych ward. I said, well, let's ask first, why are you suicidal? What happened? It says, I'm hungry. I didn't eat anything for two days. So I said, you know, he's not suicidal, give him food. And some, and they say, this is not restaurant. I say, I understand that, uh, you know, just, just be human here. You don't need to put him in psych ward. Exactly. Yeah, okay. You just be, just kind of, you have to really think of uh, common sense here. So we mm -hmm. fed him in the morning. He's not suicidal. He thanked me. He left. Question is, yes, if I had marked the box and said, oh, okay, he's suicidal, let's put him three days in hospital. Let's waive all his rights and put him in, and then he'd be really crazy. He's hungry. He's he's upset, and so you have to understand, you know, that right. Uh, not and, everybody and, needs that. Yeah, and that's something that uh, you know I think a lot of people know, but not everybody knows is that an awful lot of homeless people have mental issues, and that's why they're homeless. It's you know, I mean, face it, it, nobody with a sane mind would choose to live a homeless lifestyle. Yeah. It, uh, it, it's something that it comes about usually because of either uh, drug problems, which I would argue is also mental in nature, in nature, or because they do have debilitating mental situations, whether it be uh, some form of like uh, paranoid schizophrenia or mm -hmm. or things of that nature, but it is definitely debilitating. And that's also where a lot of our petty crime comes from, a lot of thefts and, and things of that nature, uh, con men, you know, people trying to get the next fix. And so that is definitely detrimental to our society. And again, that's a fascinating part of what we do when we look at crime and we study it, is we learn a lot of the root sources of it. And that's, that's, that's my area of interest is, is uh, one, I want to understand, and two, and actually number two is probably foremost, I want to help people. I mm -hmm. want to help them get justice. I want to help them get closure. And that is why, at Speaking of Crime, we're so focused on the unsolved crimes. Is right. We just, we want to help. We want to do good. And I think that is such a fascinating, it's a difficult work because, you know, people are biased in terms of the moment they say, okay, he's a criminal. And then, but he's a criminal, that's true, but he or she, whatever. And then, uh, you know, the problem is, Nobody wants to know why, what happened, and what was reason behind it, or, or, or what were what the circumstances, or, and yes, I know, and can we can we rehab those? Can we get them better? I'm sure you have probably interviewed some serial killers or something, and I, don't take me wrong, but there are people, of course, they will be bad no matter what you do. And they will be like that for sure. We're not defending everybody, but I think it gives us kind of understanding to improve our thinking and and maybe learn for the next ones, um, for the upcoming ones, and also solve the biggest crisis: jails and how to rehab them. And let's say if they get um, crime, and can they go back ever? or in this I, I think stands very well for kids you know uh, their whole life could be totally ruined because you know maybe their mind was not mature enough at that age or you know to understand the consequences right yeah um there's there's been a lot in tv lately about uh, uh young underage killers and whether they truly deserve these life sentences or not. And they actually have to be resentenced. Uh, now, if they had been sentenced to life and they weren't 18 years of age, <clears throat> a recent Supreme Court ruling 
has said that they must be resentenced as adults. And that allows some of them an opportunity to get out of prison. Sometimes uh, not. You know, each case is looked at. And I think most of them are properly punished, you know, with the resentencing. Um, They tend to go hard on the people that show little or no remorse. And they tend to look a little more leniently on the people that, uh, A, show some remorse, and B, might have been uh, sentenced because they happened to uh, be with the people that committed a crime, but like sitting outside in a car not knowing what's going on inside a house or a store or whatnot. And so some of those people are being released. And I think that's that's an appropriate way to handle it. I mean, let's face it, uh, how many of us are the same person at uh, 35 and 45 and 55 that we were at 15? I mean, you know, most people mature at some point. Yeah, and, you know, the other problem we are facing, of course, big one is uh, drugs, you know. So if yeah. they were under the influence of either alcohol or drugs or even some thing they took, and then I don't know. So this yeah, the- some of some of those you can argue that they weren't even even in their right mind. I mean, if they were blackout drunk, if they were on PCP, uh, some of those drugs, you know, LSD, some of those things are so hallucinogenic that they would in no way conform to being in a state of reality in their head at the time when the crime may have been committed. Uh, However, I do think it may be a telling thing that they were capable of trying to uh, do something violent while under the influence. I mean, is that something that we want to uh, easily let out into our society someone that may go back on drugs and may become that violent yet again. Yeah, and there there are kind of many layers of understanding it has to happen. I mean, and but you know, one thing for sure, you take the topic which has so much depth and it needs so much learning, and I'm sure you're doing a phenomenal job at least putting the message out and uh, raising this awareness. I think this is a difficult topic, but um, I really congratulate that you're doing the phenomenal work. Keep oh, up and uh, keep coming to our podcast. Keep us updated. I mean, I love talking about, uh, you know, I did not know about that crime myself. Uh, you know, the other one, you know, we watch headline news, as you know, we all, just, yes. but nobody looks at the other ones. Uh, what happened in town, what happened in your area, and those are equally important. So, yeah, thank you for uh, for this great work. And uh, where people can watch your podcast? Uh, you can watch us on uh, it, it. We we download it to, uh, or rather, upload it to Podbean, but you can get it on everything. iTunes, we're on Spotify, uh, just anywhere that you normally stream. There are very few venues that we're not available on. So wherever you normally stream your podcast, you can find Speaking of Crime. Okay. And uh, just check out his name. And that's under your name anyways. So uh, take care. Uh, no, there's there's actually three of us involved in Speaking of Crime. I'm just one of the co-hosts. There's, okay. Gia, Wirt, there's Gia Wirtz, who is a true crime documentary producer and director. Mm-hmm. And there's John N. Gully, John N. Gully who is, oh, he's going to hate me for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> he is a true crime audiobook narrator, and he is our sound engineer. Very and nice, producer. very nice. Let's see if, uh, now we know all three. Well, you got three musketeers for sure. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do. It's a good group. We're all okay. we're all true crime professionals. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, take care and uh, stay blessed. And um, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. If I don't see, you, thank you, care. and Happy take Holidays it. to you as well. Take it.